Okay, well, um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is um, uh, Dr. Lance Ingwersen. I, um, I'm honored to present as part of JSU's uh, 2020 Celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, this is a celebration that began in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week. Uh, and then 20 years later, uh, through uh, some bipartisan legislation, it became Hispanic Heritage Month. So that was in 1988. That was 32 years ago. Um, and it is meant to celebrate and recognize the contributions of, um, of Hispanic Americans, a group that we often now refer to as Latinx, um, that have made so the contributions that this group has made to society and culture in the U.S. So let me tell you a little bit about me before we really fully get started with the uh, presentation. I'm a historian by training. Uh, my research uh, focus is on modern Mexico. And so in tonight's presentation, you're gonna get a little bit of food history. Um, I'm not a food historian, but I am a food lover. Um, and so, um, so what I hope to offer you tonight is a good mix of culture, of history, of personal anecdotes, and with a little dash of popular culture and the way that we've set up tonight is I'm going to offer a, uh, uh, maybe a 20 to 25 minute presentation, go into a, a little bit of depth on a few of these foods, uh, and then we're going to transition into a, a panel discussion. I've got a couple of uh, panelists who are here. I'll introduce them uh, right before we transition into that, and then we're going to open it up for uh, questions and answers um, from all of you. If you have questions, you're welcome to submit them to the chat box. Uh, or once the panelists have answered some of the questions, then, um, then you can uh, uh, answer the questions at that point in time. A couple things to note. One, there's a food theme that runs through this year's celebration. We had tacos on the quad last week. I'm talking about food and culture uh, tonight. We, there was a, uh, a coffee and pastry uh, event earlier this week. And then there's a movie that's coming up that's like Water for Chocolate, that's all about food and uh, and so, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the history of some of the foods. And some of these food, these foods have largely made their ways into all corners of the United States. The focus today is going to be on Mexican food, and culture, and identity, um, because I I know Mexico better. But um, uh, our panelists will expand that discussion to um, Colombian food, and. Uh, you know, it's I, I want to make clear that even though the focus is on uh, Mexico, Mexican food and cuisine, um, of course, people uh, of Latin American descent uh, come from all sorts of different places. They're not all Mexican. Um, the multiplicity of cultures and cuisines is really remarkable. Uh, but if we tried to do all of that tonight, we would all get teams out is a new phrase that I've begun to use. Um, this is new, like social distancing and COVID grace and other kinds of terms that, uh, that, uh, that I, I find myself using now. And, and I want to make sure we don't do that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, I'm going to show you some images as I talk through uh, parts of this presentation. And then after that, I will transition back to so you can see me and then I'll introduce our panelists. All right, so um, so the, I titled this presentation Tacos, Tamales, and Tortas Oh My. Um, all three of these foods uh, originate in Mexico, uh, although tamales now can be found all over as, as well as uh, some of these other types of foods. Um, and so uh, this is, this is kind of where I want to start, um, or, or where I want to start is, in, um, is just to talk a little bit about how some of this cultural diffusion has happened in the U.S., um, you've probably noticed this if you go to grocery stores here. Uh, I grew up outside of Atlanta, and so over the course of my childhood and into my adult life, um, I've noticed this a lot. When you go to the grocery store, uh, we now have uh, much larger selections of various kinds of food items. Um, and uh, several decades ago, salsa surpassed ketchup in terms of market share in the United States. Um, tortillas surpassed hamburger and hot dog buns. Tortilla chips outsell uh, potato chips, and so these are just uh, this is just one one example of the ways in which the the culture um, uh, has diffused in the United States. Um, you may also notice that there are a ton of Mexican restaurants, 
Uh, and they are found in all sorts of different cities, uh, small towns. You now even see taquerias uh, that have popped up in different places. And in the United States, there are more than 60,000 Mexican restaurants that are registered. They are the second most common food type found in the United States, and they make up 10% of all restaurants. Um, and so these, the, these changes, though, uh, have to do with demographic changes that have been happening, but that have really um, transformed in the last three or four decades. You can see here from this chart, um, the United States Hispanic population uh, is, is very close to about 61 million now. Uh, but if you look at the numbers, you know, in 1970, there were only 9.6 million. And so what we see is, is uh, rapid growth uh, of this population in the United States. This would be inclusive of people who identify as Hispanic, um, who have parents or family members. Uh, and uh, it also includes uh, recently arrived uh, immigrants from Latin America. And so this, this transformation has been really uh, remarkable in the United States. Um, it has changed the demographics. And as a byproduct of that, um, it has changed uh, cultural patterns and practices. To show you one other uh, chart, this is the projection of the growth of the Hispanic population uh, over the next several years. In 1980, um, about six and a half percent of the United States population was Hispanic. And if you look here, we are now at about 19 percent, somewhere between 18 and 19 percent. And if the um, if these trends are correct, uh, the Latinx population um, in the United States will make up almost 30 percent of the uh, of the entire country by 2060. Um, so this is a uh, it's a group that's continuing to grow. Um, it's continuing to have a greater voice politically. Um, it's continuing to, uh, you know, uh, uh, transform society and culture here. Now I want to show you one more chart. Um, and that is to say that this growth has happened extremely quickly, especially in the southeast or the the, the southeast region. Um, you can see on this chart that the highest gross numbers of people who've moved into the region in the last 10 years um, <clears throat> versus all the other regions, uh, it's higher in the South in terms of the total numbers and as a percentage of the population, um, it's, also, uh, it's also larger. This is true in the state of Alabama. Uh, in 2010, about 4% of the state uh, population of Alabama uh, identified as Hispanic or Latinx. And that number has grown by uh, 2018, which is the most recent statistics, to about 4.6%. So Alabama still ranks relatively low, um, but it is to say that uh, that this uh, these these people that come from um, Latin America who identify as uh, as as Latinx uh, have grown much beyond the traditional gateways of California and Texas and Florida um, and New York. Uh, and elsewhere where we used to see the, the largest concentrations of them. All right, you all came here for food. So let me talk a little bit about um, food. If those demographics help, uh, help us better understand that, um, I want to talk a little bit about food. And um, if you have not yet eaten, I think that this presentation might make you hungry. And if you are eating, good for you. Um, the one way to think about food and culture, uh, a helpful way to think about food and culture is through, uh, through the idea of hybridity, um, which is to say that all sorts of different cultural traditions, whether we're talking about language, whether we're talking about food, um, whether we're talking about uh, music and dance, uh, it results from the ways that uh, different cultural traditions mix and match and new kinds of culture are formed. And, um, and that's true for all the food that I'm going to talk about today. Um, this presentation is going to focus on three of them, and we're going to start out with tacos. Tacos are a pretty common food now in the United States. They can be found nearly everywhere. Um, my first experience eating a, uh, and I'll use quotes for this, a, a Mexican taco, right, or a taco autentico, um, as it's sometimes referred to, an authentic taco, was in South Texas. I was living in a little town uh, called Far near McAllen. It's across the border from Reynosa. My roommate and I found this little um, little taqueria that was around, and 
you know, it, it was a taco that, that looks very much like in this image. It was two small corn tortillas that were uh, that, that uh, were filled with um, with, you know, a bistec that were that were filled with um, with beef. Um, carne asada is sometimes something that you might um, hear it referred to. Uh, fresh corn tortillas. There was a little bit of onion, a little bit of cilantro. There were two different kinds of, uh, of salsas. There was a spicy, thin, kind of runny green salsa and a smoky or red salsa um, and lime slices. And that was really, for me, this was, I was probably 21, 22. This was probably the first type of taco like this. I had grown up in my own house eating those taco, the hard taco shells that come in boxes from old El Paso and other things like that. And I tried this taco and it just, it, it stuck with me. Um, and and it, is, uh, it is something that I really enjoy eating because of its simplicity. Uh, you don't have to dress a taco up for it to taste really delicious. And, uh, and so I wanted to share that story. I wanted, I'm, I'm gonna throw in a few anecdotes as we go. Um, but the taco, has also recently featured on a new show on Netflix. So those of you that have Netflix subscriptions, I highly recommend. I've watched the first three episodes from season one. Um, it's something called The Taco Chronicles. And so I wanna play this trailer for you. <clears throat> All right. And unfortunately, I saw in the uh, I saw in the chat box for some of you that uh, you couldn't hear the audio on that. So um, so I'll drop that into the chat box if you want to watch that. Um, you can find it on um, ah. you can find it. Um, it basically, you know, if you just do a quick search on um, on Netflix for um, the Taco Chronicles season two, the trailer, and uh, and you'll be able to find that. Um, that the show it was produced in Mexico. Uh, it takes you to lots of different towns. Uh, it, it interviews restaurateurs and cooks and. Um, waiters and servers and, and and all sorts of different people who were involved in the tacos. And it tells you a little bit about the history of each different kind of taco. So you have suadero, which is a cut of, um, of beef uh, that, uh, that that is highlighted in one of these episodes. Um, this is a, a very traditionally Mexican type of taco from Mexico City. It's called Tacos al Pastor. If you look at this, you'll notice it looks kind of like a gyro. And in fact, the history of this traces back to Lebanese immigrants who um, who came to Mexico. And um, and so this is basically marinated pork with um, spice mixtures and other kinds of things that's roasted. It's, it's layered on top of a spit. Um, and then there's usually a piece of pineapple that's roasted that gets uh, added onto that along with your cilantro. Um, tacos al pastor are, are delicious if you ever get a chance to try them, um, especially the ones in Mexico City. Uh, 
tacos de asada, de carne asada, de bistec is often another way that uh, another type of uh, 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 you know description that's used for for carne asada. Cochinita. This is from the Yucatan, so this is a, a you know a Mayan um, uh, kind of a recipe for um, for for pork with uh, pickled red onions. Birria comes from uh, the, the region of Jalisco, from the state of Jalisco. Um, and this is meat that's stewed in a sauce and then served up in tacos. Um, cabrito is goat. Um, and of course, they also uh, depict American tacos and, uh, and tacos de guisado. And there are so many other kinds. There's tacos of de, de lengua, which is tongue. There are tacos de canasta, which are these basket tacos. And um, it's just to say that there are a true, there's a tremendous variety of tacos. Um, and, uh, and I encourage you, if you find places that you can go to, I encourage you to, um, to, to try out some of these different kinds of tacos. Um, Cause they really are, um, they really are delicious. And then the last thing I wanna say about tacos is to take you back just a little bit of the history. Um, if we break down the parts of a taco, a corn tortilla, corn was domesticated by Mesoamericans thousands of years ago. So that piece has pre-Columbian, when I say pre-Columbian, I mean pre-Christopher Columbus um, and European uh, encounters with Native Americans starting in the late 14, or the early 1490s. Um, but tacos as we know them as these little small sort of uh, flour or, or corn tortillas, uh, sometimes flour tortillas, depending on where you are, that are filled with uh, with a meat and usually uh, you know onion and cilantro and stuff. The very first mention of those we have in their current form um, is in a really popular novel from Mexico from the uh, 19th century called uh, "The Bandits of the Rio Frio" uh, by an important uh, author and and, and intellectual and statesman Manuel Paino. Um, and then we see them in Mexico City um, through. Uh, you know, people who are in the working class, tacos were cheap, tacos were uh, relatively easy to make, and um, and here we see paper boys who are eating brunch, a brunch of tacos in Mexico City. And so tacos really are, they're a street food, um, they're a food of the working class, um, although nowadays tacos, you can find super fancy tacos almost anywhere you are. Um, you can find, uh, if you go to Las Vegas, there's a restaurant in Las Vegas that sells tacos, like handheld tacos, for between $47 and $78 a taco because it has expensive caviar. Um, so there is, there's a tremendous variation. Um, tacos are popular now among all different classes, uh, but it started out as a lower class uh, or working class kind of a food and it's migrated its way up. And now tacos are ubiquitous both in Mexico and all across the United States. Um, I have family in Northwest Alabama. So for those of you who are familiar with Alabama, and uh, we used to take the old 78 before uh, Interstate 22 was constructed all the way up there. And in the old 78, when you go up through Jasper and then you make your way to Carbon Hill and Winfield and Guin and Guin, um, Carbon Hill has taquerias now. Uh, so this is all part of this demographic transformation um, that really is changing uh, and opening opportunities for uh, for Americans, rural and urban, to uh, to taste some of this food. All right, I'm going to transition on to tamales. Um, I say that this is an impossibly brief history of the tamal because unlike tacos, tamales are some of the oldest foods around. Um, most people who study this uh, think that tamales originated with Mesoamericans sometime between 8,000 and 5,000 BCE. Um, so that is, you know, 10, up to 10,000 years ago, we have the first, uh, the first, the origins of, of the tamal. Um, at first they were unfilled. They were basically just malls of, uh, balls of masa that were baked and dipped. Um, in various kinds of sauces. They would later be filled. Um, and they are, um, they, have, they have spread. So their origins are in Mexico and Guatemala with Mesoamerican societies, but they have spread all over Latin America. Um, Mayans and Aztecs used them as portable food for hunters and travelers. 
Um, and one thing that we see, uh, and so this, uh, I'll come back to this picture in just a second. In a mural from the pre-classic period, so this is from, you know, um, basically 1000 BC all the way up until 250 uh, CE or AD, um, we have a mural. And if you look really carefully at this mural, um, there are scholars who study food who see this right here as an offering, um, and they see it as an offering of tamales. Um, so it is to say that this is a real mixing of traditions. Um, Aztecs used to use these for celebrating important festivals. Um, women, Aztec women would get together and make a huge batch of tamales. Uh, they stuffed them with beans and chiles, shrimp, and, ch and, 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 uh, and, you know, depending on the celebration. When Europeans came over, they brought new foods. And so one of the things that we, uh, we begin to see are, you know, instead of just turkey and fish or iguana, which were the pre-Columbian, like before the Europeans arrived, then we begin to see them made with chicken and beef and pork and lard, um, where they used to be filled with wild greens and herbs and amaranth and mushrooms. Now we see them filled with cheese and almonds and raisins. So all of that is part of something we call the Columbian exchange, which was uh, ways in which diseases and germs and plants all crossed the Atlantic through these, uh, these encounters uh, starting in the 15th century. Um, they can be wrapped in different ways. Here's where I'm going to go back. Um, depending on where you are, um, they're always wrapped in plant leaves. Uh, the ones here on the right that you can see, these are corn husks. Um, this is, you know, in areas where there would be uh, lots of corn. In more tropical regions, you might see them uh, with banana leaves. Um, and every single one of these is a little bit different. So, you know, what people will tell you is every family has their own special blend of spices, the, their own consistencies and textures, their own flavors that come into this. So they can always tell which, which tamales are from their family and which tamales are from other families around. Um, this is a big tradition around any kind of a celebration in Mexico. If you get in the, uh, on the, um, the, the day of the Three Kings Day in January, if you get the little baby in the Rosca de Reyes, um, the king cake, then you have to bring tamales. You have to make and bring tamales to the next celebration in February. Um, you'll see them at weddings, at baptisms, at, at all sorts of important um, kinds of events around Christmas time. This is a really common um, uh, scene that you might see. I have a sister-in-law who's Costa Rican, and uh, her family used to get together and make hundreds of tamales in various rooms of the houses. It's a shared task. You can see this image of, uh, of, of some individuals from, this is in El Paso, Texas. Um, but it is just to say that, that if, the, if the taco is a little bit uh, more recent development, uh, tamales are extremely old. Their roots go really deep. Um, corn and tamales had important ritual, important um, uh, functions for all sorts of Mesoamerican peoples for thousands of years. All right. Third one, last one before we move over to the um, to the to the panelists are tortas. As you can see from these images here, tortas are are, are sandwiches, um, and like all of these, um, like all of these different kinds of uh, of food items, there's a really spirited debate about where they started. Um, so people in Puebla who like to uh, who call tortas sort of an invention of, of, of people from this region. Uh, it's in southern Mexico, a little bit southeast of Mexico City. Um, people from Puebla, you know, basically would say, well, Europeans brought wheat over, and this bread is made out of wheat. And the kind of bread that you see in, in tortas that are in, in Puebla um, are called uh, teleras. So it's a different kind of bread. Other people point to the French intervention in the 19th century. Um, there were a bunch of French bakers in the 19th century, and they brought, of course, French bread. And, um, and so bolillos are a particular kind of bread that's often used for these. Um, and they are a, they're basically like a little tiny French loaf of bread uh, that, uh, that serves as the bread, and then, and then everything else goes in the, um, in the middle of them. Uh, and then there's a story that they really first appeared in the 1890s in Mexico City um, by this little bread seller. His name was um, his name was Armando. Uh, and so the story goes with Armando is that, 
he was a, a poor bread seller and he would um, basically bring in, uh, he would fill his bread with anything that he had on hand and thus was born the torta. And the torta is the quintessential um, uh, street food. It's a quick snack. It is, uh, it's easily portable, transportable, so somebody can get it and eat it while they're moving from one thing to another. Um, this right here is a very traditional torta from Mexico City. This is a torta cubana, even, and even though it would suggest that it was uh, of Cuban in origin, uh, it's not, it's from Mexico City. It has at least four types of meat. So here you'll see hot dog, you'll see ham, you'll see chorizo, and I think under here they might have snuck in milanesa, which is basically a fried flattened chicken or pork. Um, you'll see a fried egg on this. Uh, you'll see cheese, you'll see guacamole. Uh, you know, it's usually slathered in mayonnaise or something like that. And, um, and so these are also very hearty and very um, filling, even if they're not particularly healthy. The other torta that I want to, and, and they make tortas of everything. They have tortas that are filled with a tamal. So, so it's basically like the last two food items together. And in Mexico City, they call those guajolotas. Um, it's super starchy and very, very filling. Um, or here, when, we, when I was living in Mexico City, uh, several blocks away from where we lived, there was this famous woman who had a little cart on the corner and she sold, uh, she sold tortas de chilaquiles. Chilaquiles tend to be a breakfast item um, in Mexico. And, um, and they, they, this was a line that every single day that she was out there snaked about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and people would come there and they would wait in line and we did the same thing. We nicknamed this the bomba just because of how incredibly filling it was. When you hold it in your hand, it feels like a brick. Um, and so, you know, these tortas, they can be filled with most anything. And, uh, and that's one of the great things about food and culture, uh, is that, you know, they're, they're always mixing and matching and, and things are changing and they're evolving and, uh, and, and it's really, um, really amazing. And as the video stated for the Taco Chronicles, this takes me back to those moments, right? A really good taco or any kind of food can take you back into a particular moment. Um, and I think that is probably true for most all of us. All right. So I have plenty more that I could say, but I've been talking for a while. And so um, so what I would like to do now is I want to open it up to our panelists. Um, and I want to pose a few questions to our panelists um, before we open it up for an audience um, Q&A. So uh, our, our two panelists today, uh, Dr. Eduardo Pacheco, um, Dr. Pacheco is from Colombia. He's an associate professor of Spanish at JSU. He's been here since 2006. Eduardo, if you want to say hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and Flor Gordillo, who's a senior here at JSU. Um, she's from Guanajuato, Me uh, Mexico. She's studying to become an English teacher. Um, and so I thank both of them for graciously agreeing to be on this panel um, and for sharing some stories about food and culture, the intersections of food, culture, and identity with, uh, with all of us. And um, so I'll start, uh, I'll start with Flor. Flor, I want to ask you, and then I'll, and then I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Pacheco the same thing. What role does food play in your life, or how does food figure into your own identity or history? So for me, food is everything. Like literally, if I could eat uh, food all day, I would, but that's not very good for your health, especially if it's Mexican food, That then you don't want to eat Mexican food all day, every day. But for me, food represents family. I grew up uh, with my family in Mexico, of course, and every time at dinner time, every day at dinner time, we would just sit together eat and talk about our day, what we did, what we didn't do, what kind of bothers us, or just the highlights of our day. Um, and food also, it's part of my family history. We have recipes that date back from like probably the Mexican Revolution and we just pass it down. And in that, those types of recipes, we don't have them on paper. So for me, we have to be in the kitchen with our grandmothers or grandparents or, or grandfathers just watching and making sure that we remember what they put and how they put it and how much or how little they did because they don't write it down they just know it 
And sometimes they add a little bit of something that they want to put in there. Sometimes they just skip some parts just to please everybody. But, but yeah, that, that's how food plays a role in my life. All right, great. Thank you, Flor. Um, Eduardo, how about you? Um, well, uh, I grew up in a restaurant, so <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, by the age of eight, I was um, not cooking. I'm not, I, don't, I don't cook well, so I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm not a good cook. Although I grew up in a restaurant, food for me was everything, and <laughs> I saw how the food was made. Although, um, because we were so many people and we were little, my mother didn't allow us to be inside the kitchen. So, but then I, um, right now, I think uh, one of the things I remember the most is just the smell of food. And, and it's one of the, the things your memory will always carry with you everywhere you go. Uh, you always uh, smell and you immediately recognize the, 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 the dish or whatever they're cooking. And it brings you back all the memories, all the way back to uh, your family and your gatherings and, and then everything, uh, every celebration, uh, because as Flor said, food, it's part of um, the daily life of a uh, family. And um, so we have in Colombia, uh, I come from the Caribbean north of Colombia or part of Colombia in the north. So um, we in Colombia, because of a geography is very diverse. We have all kinds of uh, different food and different uh, dishes that we we always have. So um, you you also attach the food with a ethnicity of a, the, the person in Colombia. So if you are, for example, the Caribbean, you, you think about rice uh, with all the spices from that region, which are coconut, and you have uh, fish also. You have uh, lots of soups uh, with fish. And if you are from the mountains in the Andes, um, so you have, uh, according to the geography, you immediately um, say, OK, you must be eating this, or do you miss this uh, part? of whatever the main dish of this region is. So it's always uh, ethnicity, food, and and then smells. They're always combined. And of course, when you're living in the United States, it's kind of hard to um, get all the ingredients, although with the globalization, we have more and more uh, stores, uh, Mexican stores, obviously. They're everywhere. But then uh, it's kind of hard to find uh, in Mexican stores what whatever comes from the, all the different countries in Latin America. So what we have is just made this hybrid station, if I can call that, yeah. uh, of like, OK, you don't have this uh, kind of um, spice, but then you can replace it with this Mexican spice. And so it made it made easier just to to blend the ingredients with us. So I think uh, bringing uh, culture to the United States, uh, you must bring what whatever uh, you left behind and easier and the easier part is just food prepare and share with your your friends. Although I said I don't cook much, I do have a few um, kind of cars under my sleeve. So I, I cook sometimes coconut rice, one of my specialties. <laughs> and I also do tamales um, and, and I learn how to do um, Mexican tamales, which is very interesting for me because our tamales are very uh, different from the Mexican ones. And we, uh, we use, um, uh, we call it, well, it's sometimes plantains uh, leaves, but then there is a there is a, a grass that grows in, in the swamps in the, in in the north part of uh, Colombia or with their swamps. That's called bihau, and this is a very um, it looks like um, I cannot really uh, put together what would be uh, like in here, but the taste of the uh, tamal made with that kind of leaf is a completely different um, story mm -hmm. of. Uh, with plantains or with corn. And that's when I talk about smell because when they're cooking, the, because they have to cook the leaf first. And if you're cooking the leaf in whatever uh, part of uh, your neighborhood, you know that house is making tamales. And so <laughs> you immediately uh, kind of walk by or call, are you making tamales? So just that is, is, uh, is, uh, is, it's a reminding of where you come from. So here, I've, I don't find the leaves, so I, I was um, sort of introduced to the Mexican tamales, which I've not, never had before in Colombia, and I, I love them. And I kind of also incorporate my own Colombian uh, idea of 
I was just putting more more things inside the tamale, so it will become a little fatter. Yeah, <laughs> which <laughs> and then more more of a meal than just a snack. Right. So right. that's that's what uh, I have, and so eating eating here in the United States nowadays have become easier. Whatever you come from in Latin America, because of all the import and uh, things that you can have uh, around. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, you kind of anticipated my second question a little bit and answered it with the coconut rice and the tamale. So, um, Flor, what's a dish that you grew up with that reminds you of home that you cook that uh, that you can tell us about and a little bit about the ingredients too? So, growing up, I grew up with a ton of enchiladas. Like, every morning, enchiladas at my grandmother's. I grew up with machaca, which was one of my grandfather's specialty and montalayo which is just the belly of the of um cow what can i say the the cow yeah mm -hmm. cow guts with, like <laughs> yeah with with it's 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 the cow gut that puts the meat together so mm -hmm. you get the meat from the cow and then you wrap it with the gut it's like a big sausage but mm -hmm. it's, it's way better than a that than churri <laughs> And then, then um, like. yes, <laughs> uh, I grew up with eating pan dulce and chocolate abuelita with my grandparents too. Um, what else? And a, a lot more. Yeah. Tacos, tortas, guaraches, which are the bigger version of the tacos or quesadillas. I don't know. It could be both ways. But my favorite, my absolute favorite is enchiladas. I love enchiladas, and I, you can never go wrong with enchiladas. You can make them with red salsa or green salsa. Uh, what I like is my grandmother's recipe. She has, like, two versions, I would say. One is with um, fresh uh, cut tortilla chips, fried tortilla chips, and the store-bought totopos, which are how we call the tortilla chips in Mexico. Um, so she would get all that prepared before she even begins the sauce. So for the sauce, she would get either, if you want red uh, salsa, you do tomatoes, some chile serrano, and a little bit of garlic. So you boil them up or you toast them, roast them, whatever. Then you blend them in the um, blending machine. And then you put them in a saucepan, you let them simmer a little bit, add some salt, you caramelize some onions, you put them in there. Whenever everything's ready to go, you just add the totopos or the tortilla chips into the sauce. And depending of the, I guess, the taste of the person or los gustos de, of whoever, mm. um, I like mine soggy, so I let them, I let my plate be served at the very end because I like them soggy so that the flavor is very present um, and whenever she puts them in the plate she drizzles some Mexican crema which is our version mm -hmm. of sour cream but it's a little bit a little bit more liquid yeah it's a little so runnier mm -hmm. yes yeah, runnier mm -hmm. and she just drizzles some on top of it with a little bit of sprinkled queso fresco which is amazing uh and then she either puts some scrambled eggs in with the sauce or she just fries some eggs and sunny side up i guess that's the version of what how my huevos would look like and just do you, you just put them in the plate and you can add some beans with it, but I don't really like beans with my chilaquiles. So um, that's how my breakfast would look. But I would also eat them for lunch or dinner because they're so oh. amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, <laughs> yeah. No, I was going to say, but, um, you know, all of those things as you were talking about it, you know, and tamales for sure. They are. They take so long to make all of these yeah. things, right? When you start thinking about like all the ingredients that go in and the preparation, right? This is like, you know, you start adding up hours in the kitchen mm -hmm. trying to get all these things ready. And, and even days. My grandmother, if she would, if she was going to fry the tortillas in the morning, 
she would get buy the tortillas the day before. You know, the tortillas are fresh. Right. So she would buy the tortillas the day before, let them dry a little bit, put them in the fridge for a, a couple of hours. Then in the morning, she would cut them and then fry them. And oh, goodness. It's just... <laughs> I can smell it and I can taste it right now. You have no idea. It's just great. Right. Which is, I mean, which is what uh, Dr. Pacheco was talking about too, right? It takes you back to places. It can, it, you know, yes. they, they transport that, right? It, it, it like take, brings back all these memories and people yes. and experiences and, and things like that. All right. The last one before we open it up to the audience um, for questions for any of us is, um, uh, you know, I, I have no skin in the game here, but um, can you give anybody who's listening recommendations for places around here or, or close by and a particular dish that they sell that you really like? And I'll let either so, start on that one. All right, Flora, go for it. So I don't really, or I don't usually eat out that much. And if I do, and if I go to a Mexican restaurant around the Jacksonville area, um, I mean, they're not as authentic as I would like them to do. But I, one time, went with my friend to Alberville. And I feel like Alberville is like a little mini version of Mexico because they have everything that I would love for Jacksonville to have. Um, I went to La Orquídea. And let me tell you, they have, some, I got some chilaquiles from there. They were good. Not as good as my grandmother's, but they were good. <laughs> so I would recommend you guys to go to La Orquídea. In Albertville. If you, in Albertville. And All right. also, right across the street, there's a panaderia or a bakery, La Gelaguetza, and they have the best andulce that you can find around here. Just saying. All right. Named after that Oaxacan festival, right? Yay. <laughs> Yay. Um, great. All right, Dr. Pacheco. Um, well, there are no Mex uh, Colombian Mexican restaurants around, so I right. don't know. Uh, it's just basically Mexican uh, reproductions of what Mexican uh, food would look like. Uh, of course, we all know it's Tex-Mex, but uh, if you happen to be in Atlanta, as probably many of you, uh, because it's not too far, um, I would recommend there are a few now uh, Colombian restaurants, and the one I usually go is called La Casona. And that is in Doraville, and many of you can find it on on, on the website. It's um it's very is a is is a um version of uh, the Andean uh, regions in in Colombia. Uh, so you will find something called bandeja bandeja paisa. Paisas are the ones from um, Medellin and the area in the uh, region where coffee grows in Colombia. So we don't have restaurants from the Caribbean, which that will be unfortunately. For me, but um, I one time when I moved to the United States, uh, my sisters and I we thought about opening a Colombian restaurant. At this point in my life, uh, it's, I, after growing up in a restaurant, I don't think so. So, guys, I recommend you to go to Atlanta, or if you are obviously in Florida, you will find in Miami uh, many um, versions of what Colombian restaurants are. Uh, but La Casona is a good it's a good idea if you're in the mood or you want to try something different than Mexican, uh, go to La Casona. They, they're, right. not paying, they're not paying for this, so I wish. <laughs> I know, I know. I wish I were getting some kickbacks on this too. I'm just dropping into the chat um, the two restaurants, like the websites for the two restaurants that you both mentioned. So if anybody who's um, who's listening is. Uh, you know, is, is curious about finding these. I'm gonna just uh, drop those into the chat so you can you can explore those if you uh, if you want to. And Arlene tells us to try King Pollo in Albertville um, as well. All right. Well, great. Um, well, I'd love to open it up to the audience for questions that you have for any of us. Um, you can ask all of us. You can ask individual people. You can type your questions in the chat box if you want to. Um, you can use the little hand raise function on Teams if you know how to do that. And uh, yeah, we'd love to, to have your questions and do our best to answer them. It seems like everyone is hungry on this chat, so um, <laughs> <laughs> there's so many suggestions. I have not had dinner, so please. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, so if anybody has questions, and I know there are many people in the audience from all the countries in Latin America, so you guys can also pop in and, and share if you like to. If it's, I'm not taking over this, but, <laughs> but if you want to comment on your country, I know um, there are many um, countries that have beautiful um, uh, presentation and the taste is, is something different that we have around, so maybe you can share. Questions? Oh, I have a, I have a um, something that I would like to share. It's not a, it's not a question, but just a, um, an, an anecdote. When I first moved to the United States, I had no idea what a burrito was. So, and because we didn't have, we don't until the uh, late nineties, we got, we did not have a restaurant um, or Mexican restaurants in Colombia. Uh, so I didn't know what tortilla was. I was I ate Spanish omelets or tortillas. So they started, my students, when I started teaching here, they they started, uh, the only thing they knew, a uh, reference was about Mexican restaurants and they were talking about burritos. And I was very surprised that we eat little donkeys here. So and I was just <laughs> like, what? The Mexicans eat little donkeys? And I said, no, no, they're not donkeys. And then they started showing me, they went uh, and then they brought the next class, uh, what a burrito would like, look like, because was they were surprised that I didn't know what a burrito was. And I didn't know what a tortilla was, so I, I, I was it was surprising to me and very happily surprised that uh, I, I I get to be introduced to all the uh, the magic tortillas because a tortilla in general is like a uh, it's like a, a magic act. You 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 move it around. There is a, a taco. You flip it, throw it in the air. There it comes back, and there's a burrito. You have boom boom, cut it in pieces, enchiladas, and the same tortilla. It's nothing really new. It's the same tortilla with some uh, fillings and different fillings and different um, uh, flavors of spices. And, and so also I, something I, I learned when I moved here was the, the jalapeno. Everybody uh, was uh, aware of jalapeno, but me. So uh, or jalapenos, jalapenos. So um, <laughs> we have to see that before. It's, uh, it's, my, it's our quest to teach them how to say jalapeno. If they say jalapeno, you, you can be uh, a good English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll fill in a little space, too. I mean, it's interesting the, the, the ways in which culture goes both ways. I mean, in Mexico, you can very easily find tacos gringos. And a taco gringo basically means it's got queso on it, right? It's got cheese on mm -hmm. it, um, often loaded with cheese, because the idea is that, you know, that the Tex-Mex, like, loads on cheese on top of, you know, almost everything. And uh, so you can find, yeah, you can find tacos gringos, you can find, you know, all sorts of other uh, other kinds of things. You can even get kind of like Tex-Mex in, in Mexico City. Um, so there, you know, and, and I'm sure that's true for other places. I've spent more time in Mexico City, but, uh, you know, it goes, it, it travels both ways um, in terms of thinking about culture. And there's always, you know, I mean, I think, I think you're right to call it a, a hybridization, right? Or hybridity in terms of like, at some point, it's not necessarily even worth trying to parse out what comes from where, but the ways that it all just kind of comes together and it creates new things. Um, if you if you watch the Taco Chronicles, and I'm sorry that sound didn't go through, but if you watch the Taco Chronicles, um, the very first episodes on the Al Pastor, and while traditionally Al Pastor is kind of red or orange uh, in, in terms of the color, in Monterrey, there's a restaurateur who is made black al pastor based on different spices that are that are that are so he's he's like trying to evolve al pastor or trying to sort of put a northern mexican um kind of a um, a slant on it so it's different chiles it's different spices and uh and so you know there's like food is always evolving just like language just like culture you know and and um and i mean i think it's i think it's pretty great we're we're talking about food but how about drinks because it's also something, of course, it's always associated with a uh, meal. You always drink something with your milk. M your meal, <laughs> not milk. <laughs> so uh, you um, also, I was um, I was very surprised to know uh, the, that they have horchatas here because uh, we have, we're very good with horchatas in Colombia. So when I got here and I got my, first, my horchata, I was very happy that, oh, they have horchatas here. Mm -hmm. Um, not like my grandmother used to make it, but uh, but then there is something that you cannot you can never have 
or say, oh, this is not like my mother, because obviously it's not your mother's making it. So, but, but you, you wish you, she was a one. But horchata is, a, is a, something that I've, I've become to uh, kind of addicted to, to drink with my meals. Yeah, and, and then not necessarily with Mexican uh, food. But I can eat it with beans and rice or uh, ropa vieja, that, that, that's what they call it in Cuba, uh, uh, shredded meat. And so, yeah, drinks also. The tequila also is, a, is, a, is something that very people um, also identify Mexico with uh, tequila because obviously that's where uh, it's produced. And, and But um, interesting with, with the uh, transition that tequila made uh, into the United States. Mm -hmm. And mezcal, increasingly mezcal, right? Mezcal now you can find at the uh, ABC store in Alabama, um, and that's a that's a much newer thing. Yeah, believe it or not, they've got several several different brands. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I miss about in about Mexico is that you can find little like carts with fresh fruit cut up and ready to go. And I wish they had that here. Uh, there goes a base of business there in the making. Yeah. Right. There you go, Flor. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I cannot go around. You're that. still young for that. It. Yeah, I'm too young for that. You can no. you can add all the toppings too, like the chile and polvo, right? And you yes. can, can. And a little cotija cheese. Uh -huh. Some Valentina, Tabasco, I don't know. Lime. Mm, mm, mm. Anybody has questions for us? Please ask one. Yeah, 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 ask questions. Or or jump in and talk. Don't be shy. Vance, do you cook any um, Mexican food or or uh, because you travel in Latin America, anything that uh, you sort of um, learned and then you still do it or whenever you have you have a chance do yeah. you you cook it we took some we we actually went when we were in oaxaca we took some cooking classes um with with a, this older uh lady doña maria she had like a little like homemade recipe book and we made uh we made um chile rellenos um so so these are basically like poblano peppers um that are filled with all sorts of different you know you can you can like many things you can fill them with all sorts of uh, of different things um you know, one thing that I've never tried here, but that's very seasonal for right now, given what we're celebrating is chiles in nogada, which is basically a, um, a, a poblano pepper that has pomegranate seeds and it's got like a white cream sauce. It's a very seasonal dish in Mexico. It's intentionally green, red and white um, to mm -hmm. symbolize the, the, the national colors. Um, you know, we make um, we make sort of variants on mole every now and again, Eduardo. Um, I say variants because one, it's really hard to find all the ingredients and two, it takes way too long to make a real traditional molde, um, mm -hmm. if you're not doing it with paste. And so, um, so yeah, we do that. Um, but easy things that, that, you know, students can find here are, you know, we make like, uh, like agua arte de Jamaica, which is basically a hibiscus water drink. Um, and you just put in, uh, some sugar and some lime. It's basically just steeping hibiscus leaves and you can, um, you can find those at any little Mexican tienda. Um, you can actually find them at some grocery stores in the uh, in the quote unquote ethnic or international aisle. Um, and uh, and that's a really easy thing to do. You just basically put it in water, steep it like tea, uh, add some some sugar and some lime, and it's a really delicious and refreshing drink. So um, so yeah, we do that. You know, every now and again we'll do a, a picadillo with some kind of a meat and some uh, uh, potatoes and carrots and other kinds of things like that. And so yeah, we do we do sometimes. We haven't been cooking too much because of our five year old and eleven month old. So we've been going for easier things, and a lot of the preparation often takes you know longer. But uh, but yeah, um, we actually I love to make pozole. Um, so for students that don't know about pozole, pozole is a, um, a pozole is a stew. Uh, that has hominy, so these huge corn kernels, um, usually has, uh, you know, often has some kind of meat in it. It's got some little chopped up onions and you can put other things in. It's a base. You can get pozoles that are uh, red base, green base. I've had white pozole before. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, a, it's like a comfort food to me. Like pozole is like that, 
like homey kind of thing, especially if the weather's cool and you can, you can get some of those little uh, tostadas to go with it, right? Or the totopes and, and you can eat it. And that's a really, um, so yeah, yeah, we, we do, we do some of that kind of stuff, Eduardo. <laughs> okay, good, wonderful. Yes. I was just wondering because um, every time where I, I, I've traveled, uh, one of the things I, especially during this um, uh, presentation, I've just thinking about the the food I've I've eaten and the the way I've learned how to bring back, um, or try to recreate uh, the idea of what I I had in that country. So it's is it always food like coming back to that. It brings you uh, all these memories back and and it kind of uh, enhances the um, your friendships mm -hmm. because you're. You can you can invite your friends and say, hey, I went to such and such country and look what I, I learned. And so and try to just like a putting yourself a tax to open up to what you're normally eating every day. So, yeah, no, it's great. Well, we have we have reached um, we've reached seven o'clock. And so out of respect for people's time, if there aren't questions, um, then uh, then I think what we can do is uh, we can start wrapping up. Um, what Arlene said, Arlene has lost service. I think she must be in the car now. She is going to post in this chat later the 10 winners of shirts and she'll post instructions about how to go get those shirts um, for people who are able to, uh, to join us tonight. Um, and um, yeah, and then thank you again, Dr. Pacheco. Thank you, Flor, for oh, agreeing yeah. to be on well, the panel. Anytime. Thanks and, for inviting uh, me and thanks for uh, organizing and, and being a panelist. Well, uh, and everybody who, uh, Arlene, who put together um, the um, idea of um, Hispanic heritage uh, con to continue in, in and around Jacksonville State. Because uh, although this year we cannot uh, dance the conga, at least like last year we did, uh, th uh, to, to wrap the, the gala or the night when um, our students came back. I think uh, we can do this uh, next year and then crossing our fingers. We'll do it in person and obviously because of the money we saved this year, we can have to double it <laughs> the next year. <laughs> um, there, was, there was not much money spent in food except for the tacos and I don't know what else is planned. Right. Uh, the, I think the, the, the movie that's going to be outdoors that I think is on the quad uh, should be fun. That's next week. And so make sure you check the schedule for Hispanic Heritage Month. Hopefully we'll have some good weather. I think we have a we have an indoor plan just in case. But um, but yeah, if you like food, if you've, if you've enjoyed, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, nobody wants to come here. It's chaos around here. Um, uh, but yeah, we if you enjoyed all this conversation around food, you will absolutely enjoy Como Agua para Chocolate, like water for chocolate. And um, yeah, so again, thank you very much. Uh, Arlene says she's here. So she said okay. that she can tell us who the winners are of the raffle. So see if you get picked. Arlene, I have to, I have to ask Arlene, do, or, or, or Dr. Pacheco, Flora and I also a part of this? Hey, yes, let me, yes, you are. I do need a, let me just one second. Uh, let's see here. We're almost, okay. Now you are a part of it. <laughs> but I have added everyone that joined um, and try to keep up with it throughout the uh, presentation. So if my phone will stay. OK, so I have added all the names so you can see here. Dr. Lance, there you are. Do Dr. Uh, Pacheco. Sorry, it's a bumpy road. Can you just hold on? Can you just like park? Okay. And that, are you sure you're in Jacksonville and not in Mexico? <laughs> I know, I just got to an area. Uh, or Colombia, like, I'm sorry, Flor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all the names. There's 19 participants. I added all the marketing team. I saw them, so I added their names individually. 10 winners, and we will pick random names. And so the winners are Cindy Lopez, Sebastian Mendes, Buffy, Cindy Ru Ru Ruri. I can't even say the name, sorry, y'all. Jennifer Litzy. Michaela, Marca, and Eduardo Pacheco. Yeah. So congratulations oh. to you all winners. Um, you can pick up your shirts at the admissions office. Um, I'm going to be there all day tomorrow and next week, but I'll have them ready. So you can just go through the main office and ask for them. They'll know what we're talking about. 
um, right now. Uh, and we'll look at the shirt sizes we have as well to accommodate you. Arlene, we just want to make sure those uh, shirts are um, from Mexican cotton. So <laughs> I don't know. I have, can't make promises, but I will look at that tomorrow. Um, but yes, you can stop by. <laughs> Thank you all okay. for joining today. Too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining us.